Out on the vast plains of the Kazakh steppe lies a place with an eerie secret. Covering an 18,500 square kilometer stretch of wilderness, it looks to all intents and purposes just like another swath of endless grasslands. Yet this quiet exterior hides a sinister past. During the years of the Soviet Union, this area was strictly off-limits. Those who could get close enough witnessed blinding flashes, watched in awe as mushroom clouds expanded into the sky. This place's name was the Semipalatinsk Test Site, also known as the Polygon. Today, we know it as the most nuked place on Earth. Selected in 1947 by the notorious NKVD head Leventry Beria, the Polygon saw the detonation of the first Soviet atomic bomb and the first air-tested hydrogen bomb. Over the course of 40 years, a quarter of all nuclear tests in history took place here, irradiating the empty landscape. In today's video, we're peeking inside the shadowy world of Soviet nuclear testing and meeting the people still living with its consequences. On August 12, 1953, residents in the Kazakh city of Semipalatinsk were going about their business when they saw a burning flash of light. At the time, this wasn't unusual. Atomic tests had been taking place out on the plains 150 kilometers west of their city for the best part of four years. Although Soviet radio broadcasts always tried to pass off the shaking as earthquakes, locals had long suspected something more dramatic was happening. So an unexpected flash of light in the sky, it wasn't news. What was new was what came next. A loud boom, like a thunderclap magnified, swept across the city. In its wake came a shockwave that shattered windows and lifted people from their feet. As the entire city shook, panicked locals struggled to figure out what the hell had just happened. They had no way of knowing it, but over at the Polygon, Soviet scientists had just detonated their first thermonuclear device. In the hours to come, thick black dust would fall across Semipalatinsk, drifting on the winds from the test site. No one would tell the city's hundreds of thousands of residents, but that black dust was going to doom them all. The Soviet atomic project had begun in earnest nearly eight years earlier, on August 6, 1945. That day, the world had watched in awe as the United States detonated its new superweapon over the Japanese city of Hiroshima, turning 70,000 human beings to ash in the blink of an eye. In the aftermath, Stalin had ordered his right-hand man, the sadistic NKVD head Leventry Beria, to force Soviet scientists on a crash course in nuclear physics. By 1947, Beria's team were well on their way to building a functional atomic bomb. They just needed somewhere to test it. It's at this point that Semipalatinsk's fate was sealed. A remote city in a remote republic, Semipalatinsk had been drawn into the Soviet Union along with the rest of Kazakhstan following a brief period of independence after the revolution. Hugely underpopulated, the steppe surrounding Semipalatinsk was perfect for secret weapons testing. Leventry Beria confidently informed Stalin not a single soul lived there. There was just one problem with this, though. Beria was lying. Although the Kazakh steppe beyond Semipalatinsk was devoid of cities, it wasn't empty. There were villagers like Znamenka, nomadic peoples who wandered the plain and grazing animals. In short, there was life out there. Life that would suffer if Moscow just started exploding bombs. No one knows for sure if Beria was misinformed or if he knew about these people and simply didn't care. If you've watched our video on Beria on our sister channel Biographics, you'll probably guess the most likely answer to that question. Over the next year, the Polygon was constructed using slave labor from Kazakhstan's vast network of gulags. The prisoners built not just the site itself, but also fake buildings so the effect of a nuclear blast could be measured. By fall of 1948, Beria's scientists had their first production reactor online and ready. Before a year had passed, they would have a working bomb. On August 29, 1949, people in Semipalatinsk saw the first distant flash and heard the first distant rumble. Don't worry about it, the local party told them. It's just an earthquake. But it wasn't just an earthquake. It was an atomic explosion, the Soviets' first successful test of a 22 kiloton bomb. Little did Semipalatinsk's residents know it, but there would be hundreds more to come.
The detonation of the first Soviet atomic bomb was revealed to the world thanks to radiation. A U.S. weather monitoring craft crossing between Japan and Alaska detected high levels in the atmosphere that could have only come from a bomb. On September 1949, U.S. President Harry Truman informed the world of the test. It was shocking news, news that would spark a global nuclear arms race. For the oblivious civilians living near the Polygon, though, it only meant one thing yet more tests. Over the next few years, loud booms, bright flashes of light, and mysterious mushroom clouds became a regular fixture of life in Semipalatinsk. While those in the city itself were 150 kilometers away from these tests, those who lived out on the plain were both closer and less educated. They would stand outdoors in their villages wondering at the lights. When gray dust fell, they thought nothing of just breathing it in. Yet even those who were living relatively far away were not safe. Whether through accident or design, and you can probably guess our opinion on this one, Beria had selected a test site that was swept all year round by powerful winds. Those winds carried radiation not just across Kazakhstan, but into Russia as well. All in all, it's estimated that around 1.5 million people in the Soviet Union were repeatedly exposed to radiation from the Polygon. Sometimes the effects were dramatic. Take the blast we opened our story with, the thermonuclear explosion of August 1953. Although not the biggest detonation conducted at the Polygon, that would come two years later when the USSR tested its first hydrogen bomb, it was likely the most dangerous. That day, the prevailing winds sent all the unleashed radiation sweeping over Semipalatinsk. While the damage is hard to quantify, the huge uptick in cancers and children born with deformities that happened not long after is thought to be attributed to this bomb. But the detonation with the most immediate consequences came in August 1956. That month, the Polygon tested a dirty bomb with a small yield, but designed to spread radiation far and wide. On the day the bomb detonated, the winds were extremely high. Over 400 kilometers away, 600 people in the industrial city of Ukskamengorsk came down with acute radiation sickness. All 600 were spirited away into party-run hospitals. No records remained to indicate if any of them survived. That same year, the Soviets set up their first secret lab to monitor the effects of radiation around Semipalatinsk. This being the USSR, they did it in utmost secrecy. The lab was named Anti-Brucelliosis Dispensary No. 4, after a disease that infects cattle. While people were treated for their radiation exposure there, they were never told what was wrong with them. By 1963, when the ban on above-ground nuclear testing came in, over 100 10 devices had been detonated at the Polygon. Already, at least 10,000 people had shown signs of being affected by radiation. But testing at the Polygon, it didn't end with the ban in 1963. It simply moved underground. Okay, so now it's time to take a little detour away from Semipalatinsk and tackle a question that you might have. One that probably runs along the lines of, well, gee, this does sound bad, but on the other hand, didn't the US also do loads of above ground tests near civilians? And the short answer is, well, yes, they absolutely did, but there was a qualitative difference, as we're hopefully about to see. If the bombs going off at the Polygon were the epitome of Soviet style secrecy and denial, those the US tested were a parody of the capitalist dream. The detonations took place at the Nevada test site, far out in the desert. Just as residents of Semipalatinsk got used to seeing distant mushroom clouds, so too were the American tests visible from Las Vegas. But while the powers in Semipalatinsk tried to pretend nothing was going on, the elite in Las Vegas responded with ka -ching. Throughout the 1950s, hotels in Sin City held atomic parties where you could drive out into the desert and watch as a mushroom cloud rose above the horizon. Hotels advertised rooms with windows facing the blasts. Events were held where holidaymakers drank atomic cocktails and cheered the detonations. It was big business, and best of all, it was actually safe. Unlike the Soviets, who didn't care which way the winds blew, the Americans had top meteorologists who could tell them with 100% accuracy where any radiation might fall. Or, well, so they thought. While the atomic parties were held in Las Vegas, it was residents of places like St. George, Utah, who were typically closer to the tests. For residents of this rural Mormon town, watching the bombs go off was something you did to unwind on a Friday evening, a big patriotic spectacle that doubled as a cheap night out. Unfortunately, it was also something that could leave you very sick. In 1953, a series of 11 detonations took place at the Nevada test site. In the aftermath, a film of gray dust blew into St. George. The government assured citizens that it was perfectly safe and that they should quit worrying. So people went to work, they sent their children out to play. 
It wasn't until the early 1960s that people noticed the spike in cancer rates in St. George. Today, those that suffered the effects of the American nuclear testing are known as downwinders. Although it was their illness that led to the 1963 ban on above-ground testing, the US government refused to accept responsibility. So far, you might be thinking, well, so Soviet. But there is a difference. The downwinders were able to speak out about their experiences, to campaign for recognition without worrying about getting carted off to the gulag. In 1990, their pressure ultimately led to Congress passing the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, establishing a fund for sick downwinders. By 2015, it had distributed over $2 billion. But there's a reason Semipalatinsk test site is notorious today, why it's more worthy of a video here than the Nevada test side. And that's the poisonous mix of secrecy, denial, and desire that the Soviet Union had to test radiation on its own citizens. Oh, and regarding compensation, those living today with the effects of the Polygon's tests do get money from the Kazakh government. It amounts to $12 a month. In 1965, a great rumble announced the USSR's latest short-lived testing phase at the Polygon. Way, way out in the remotest reaches of the site, an underground detonation had diverted the course of a river. But this wasn't just some accidental byproduct of an atomic test. The Soviets were experimenting with the idea of using nuclear weapons in construction projects. So you know how some firms that are involved with mining or whatever will use explosive devices to move Earth? Well, the USSR planned to do that but with nuclear weapons. The 1965 test was proof of concept, designed to show how one well-placed nuke could divert a river and create a whole new lake. Luckily, the rest of the world quickly found out about this harebrained scheme and were like, uh, guys, no, please. <laughs> but the traces of that 1965 test, they still remain out on the endless plains of Kazakhstan. Today, it's called Atomic Lake. Stretching over 500 meters with a maximum depth of 80 meters, Atomic Lake, real name Lake Shagan, looks almost inviting from its outside with its almost pristine blue water. In fact, you probably could swim in it without coming to any harm. The water itself is not especially dangerous. It's the shoreline that you have to watch out for, where pockets of radiation still remain from that blasto so long ago. Impressive as it is, though, Atomic Lake is just one site in the remains of the Semipalatinsk test site. So why don't we have a look at some of the others? If you were to travel to the Polygon, and Kazakhstan does intermittently allow tours, the surviving areas would be divided into stuff you can see without your flesh melting off and everything else. Into this latter category would fall Test Site 4A, where dirty bombs were tested. Radiation there is still between 100 and 400 times normal, so visiting, not really a great idea. The former category, though, would contain some of the area's most haunting sites. Take the geese. Sadly, not actual radioactive geese, but a series of concrete walls jutting out of the ground. Looking like giant shark fins, they were designed to measure the effects of atomic bombs on buildings, but now they look like the half-buried ruins of some ancient civilization. Other areas on the I want to visit plus it won't kill me list might be a fake underground metro station the Soviets supposedly built. We say supposedly because in our research for this video we didn't actually come across anyone who'd actually visited it, but plenty of people did assure us that it is really there. The last thing you might do as a hypothetical visitor to the Semipalatinsk test site is simply wander around with the Geiger counter looking for radiation. Lots of websites like to claim the Polygon is doused in radiation, that the ground there has radiation radiation levels 100 times normal. But radiation doesn't work like that. Rather than lying in an even blanket across the Earth, it tends to wind up in a series of dangerous hotspots surrounded by tracts of land where the radiation levels are actually normal. If you've ever been to Chernobyl, you may have seen something similar, with certain areas being absolutely fine, while others are absolutely no-go. Speaking of Chernobyl, it's time we get back to the history of Semipalatinsk. This one-time Soviet test site is a nuclear test site no longer, and there's good reason for this. It's time for us to witness the collapse of the USSR's entire nuclear program. In terms of juicy historical irony, you'd be hard-pressed to find a statement more dripping with juice than that made by Vitaly Skylarov in February 1986. The Minister for Power in Soviet-ruled Ukraine, Skylarov used a speech that month to declare, The odds of a meltdown at a Soviet nuclear plant are 1 in 10,000 years. 
Exactly two months later, the Chernobyl reactor exploded in a haze of radiation and finely tuned irony. The Chernobyl disaster is worthy of a video all on its own, and we've actually got one again over on our sister channel Biographics, but its effect across the USSR was like a whole additional explosion. Thanks to the new Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev's policy of glasnost, or openness, word of the Chernobyl disaster actually made it to ordinary people. Faced with the horrors Soviet nuclear policy could unleash, they began to protest. In Semipalatinsk, those protests would detonate like a hydrogen bomb. On February 12, 1989, a botched underground test at the Polygon accidentally released a huge amount of radioactive gas into the atmosphere. Two weeks later, the Kazakh poet Olhas Sulmanov was meant to be doing a reading on live TV, but instead he called for mass anti-nuclear demonstrations. By spring, a huge protest movement had formed in Kazakhstan. It called itself Nevada Semipalatinsk, an attempt to show solidarity with the downwinders in America. Before long, Nevada Semipalatinsk was a mass Kazakh movement. Movement. It even gained the backing of the newly installed local leader, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev. Then, on October the 19th, the Soviets detonated a double test device at the Polygon. It would be the last ever nuclear test conducted in Kazakhstan. News of the test caused tens of thousands of protesters to flood the Republic's streets. One million signed a petition demanding an end to nuclear testing. Sensing rebellion on the winds, Moscow caved. On October 21, 1989, all testing was halted at Semipalatinsk. By August 1991, the Polygon had been officially closed down. Not four months later, Kazakhstan declared independence from the Soviet Union. At the time of its final test, the Polygon had detonated 496 nuclear weapons more than any other site on Earth. Over 25% of all nukes ever detonated had gone off within its confines. But where things like nuclear weapons are concerned, the story never ends simply with the dispersal of the mushroom clouds. For the residents of Semipalatinsk, the final act is yet to come. In late 1991, when it became clear that Kazakhstan was on the verge of joining all the other republics leaving the USSR, Moscow sent officials to the recently closed Polygon. There, the men collected all the documents they could find and destroyed them. They even took the decades of medical records from the anti-Brusseliosis dispensary number no. 4. Then they got on a train back to Russia and vanished into history. With them went any hope that the world would ever understand what really happened at the Semipalatinsk test site. Fast forward to today, and what was in those missing records remains a live topic in Kazakhstan. The towns and villages surrounding the polygon are rife with cancers, congenital diseases, and birth defects. In Semipalatinsk, one in 20 children are said to be born with deformities. On the ground, people are angry. They blame the vanished Soviets for condemning them to a life in hell. But without those documents, they can never be sure. While researching this video, we came across articles in science journals like Nature, which suggested the tests must have had some impacts on local health, but cautioned against blaming radiation for every problem affecting Semipalatinsk, or as it's now known since 2007, Semi. It's worth remembering that a large number of those who died after working on the Chernobyl cleanup became sick not because of radiation exposure, but because they were so sure that they would get sick that they simply stopped taking care of themselves. It's possible something similar happened in Semi. Then again, it's also possible that we simply don't know the extent of Soviet weapons testing or what other ghoulish surprises the long-dead Leventry barrier cooked up for the locals. Whatever the truth, life around Semi is grim for those worst affected. With little government support and not much of a social safety net, they cling on at the margins of society, the victims of a policy decided decades ago in a country they're no longer part of. As for the polygon itself, it's mostly returned to nature. Seeing it today, you'd be hard-pressed to differentiate it from the rest of the endless, undulating steppe that surrounds it. But there is a difference. It's sometimes said that places where horrifying events happen retain their own special atmosphere, an invisible layer of horror that can never be scrubbed off. Usually people are talking about places like Auschwitz or Ground Zero, places of great cruelty. At the Semipalatinsk test site, though, that invisible layer is very real. The pockets of radiation that soak the earth across the gigantic site can't be seen, touched, or tasted by visitors, yet they remain, hidden evidence of the atrocities carried out here. For better or for worse, the Polygon will always carry these traces of the past, invisible reminders of the time when the Soviet Union tested its deadliest weapons on its own people. 
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. We got brand new videos just like this twice a week. So when you're subscribing, hit the notification bell. You'll find out when those come out. And as always, thank you for watching.